Good afternoon and welcome everyone. It's nice to see you here. Uh, welcome to our second uh, lecture of our spring lecture series, Building Identities. Uh, if you haven't done so, again, please make sure to grab a sandwich on the way in and enjoy uh, during our lecture today. It's wonderful to be back, back in person again and to uh, have a chance to both welcome our speaker today, who is also visiting faculty, Smith Critic, for this semester, but also to have a chance to talk to each other and debrief before, both before and after the lecture. Uh, just a reminder, we have another lecture coming up next, uh, next week. Our next speaker will be Michael Maltzen. Uh, who will be speaking at the Moody Art Center as part of the fifth year anniversary celebration of the Moody Art Center here on Rice University campus. So uh, we are hoping again to have an in-person lecture for that, uh, that as well. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, today uh, Yen Ha, who is a principal of Front Studio Architects in New York City, uh, where they work on a range of projects uh, ranging from libraries to housing to, uh, to medical buildings. She has a very interesting background both as an architect and as an artist. Uh, she has a BR from Carnegie Mellon University and has also studied abroad uh, in Paris, France. Um, she is also uh, a multilingual person as well and multi multicultural person. She's fluent um, in addition to English, she's also fluent in uh, French and Vietnamese as well. Um, as I said, she's an accomplished uh, architect as much as she's an accomplished artist and someone who really appreciates both um, the beauty of buildings and the beauty of drawings uh, at the same time. Uh, after Yen's talk, uh, Liz Galvez, our visiting critic in architecture, will help me uh, moderate the Q&A and provide some reflection uh, on Yen's talk and also moderate uh, the question from the audience. Uh, and without much more ado, please join me in welcoming Yen Ha. In welcoming Yen ha. Thank you. Thank you, Igor, for the welcome. I feel it's been a really wonderful coming to Rice, and even though I'm not here consistently, it's every time I come I feel welcomed, and I've started running into people in the hallways and you know, being able to say hi, and so I really appreciate that. Uh-oh. Okay. Um, what I particularly find really wonderful about being here this semester is in Igor's opening presentation at the beginning of the spring semester where he's talking about the connection between architecture and people that happens here at Rice. And then Anne in her lecture a couple of weeks ago also reinforced this connection by just illustrating in beautiful detail the communities for whom she works and within which she works. So I've been thinking a lot about people and I've been thinking about it because I'm more and more certain that the link between art and architecture is actually people as well. And I'm deeply interested in how architecture and art can support communities and foster connection because it is the people who bring energy and vitality to our work. Front Studio, the firm I co-founded in New York in 2001, has undergone several changes throughout the years I've been in practice. A partnership, a dissolution, a merger, and changes in space and scale. And the one constant through all its iterations is this idea that architecture places community at the forefront of design. At home, we have a phrase we use about community, which is, you're not being very aloha. And it refers to not helping clean up the table when dinner is over, or stopping mid-block and impeding the flow of traffic walking past. It's our way of saying, think about how your actions are affecting the community around you whether it's the intimate space of family or the larger experiences of being a tourist in a strange city. As architects, our work very directly affects those around us, meaning the ways in which we design holds an enormous potential for fostering interaction and exchange. I believe that our primary role as architects is to listen, and we listen to the space to discover its character and personality we hear what the surrounding context and historical lineage have to tell us. We open our eyes and minds to the client and future users to understand how these spaces will be inhabited. And we work to prioritize the experience of the human body across a breadth of scales. Our challenge as architects is to also visualize the space as an experience supporting human connection 
while adhering to the pragmatic parameters of budget, zoning, and site constraints. So the projects I'm sharing today, both theoretical and realized, both art and architecture, strive to meet these challenges with a particular consciousness towards the use of resources. As noted by Rice's president in his recent email, we must act in ways to, su to support sustainable futures. And at Front Studio, we have always taken our responsibility as stewards of the earth seriously. And we try in our architecture to consider methods that minimize environmental impact and take advantage of the resources already at hand. The first project I'll share with you is a speculative project called Pharmadelphia that we developed for the Urban Voids Grounds for Change competition, sponsored by Philadelphia's City Parks Association and the Van Allen Institute. The brief asked participants to address the problem of Philadelphia's 40,000 vacant lots in a way that could dramatically reshape the urban fabric of the city. Pharmadelphia takes inspiration from the Green Parks legacy, which dates from William Penn's time, and it overlays this historical precedent onto the present day fabric of overgrown lots and vacant buildings. Essentially, we. Ooh, Essentially, we stood on a street corner in Philadelphia, surrounded by weeds sprouting out of abandoned brick facades next to three-foot-high grasses, and imagined the lots now completely reclaimed by nature. And we wondered, how could we take advantage of an already abundant resource, which is the swaths of no longer cultivated land? So we envisioned localized centers of activity organized around a neighborhood block, each related to a specific crop. Each block would maintain responsibility for its own harvest, encouraging smaller relationships within the larger community. And in addition to the potential revenue streams, the greening of city blocks could provide ready access to fresh food. We developed plans for rehabilitating vacated structures, giving abandoned buildings a fresh purpose. So in addressing both empty lots and empty buildings, Pharmadelphia thought of farm and city as one integral machine combining elements of both for a new paradigm of urban living. Our project was selected as a finalist to move on to the final stage of the competition, uh, <clears throat> where each firm was given a specific site related to their program and charged with the further development. We developed a 10-year plan that began, you can see in the upper left-hand corner, and moves down to the lower right. By, and we began by addressing the environmental concerns around land cultivation beginning with soil testing and remediation to ascertain the viability of the lots. I don't know why it does that. Um, the city could concurrently use the time to resolve the practical issues of ownership and property, as well as identify structures for rehabilitation. So we imagined three things happening in the first several years that would plant, plant the seeds for the later phases. We envisioned a combination of bioremediation and phytoextraction for the use of vegetation like sunflowers and green mustard seeds, which we felt was important not because uh, only of its cost effectiveness, but also to contribute to a visual aesthetics of care for the neighborhood. Yep. Past the first year, buildings identified as viable could be converted to nurseries for low maintenance plants as a method of generating re revenue for the local community. So not limited by traditional definitions of urban typology, abandoned row house could be made into a stable. And the idea of taking buildings no longer conforming to current standards for habitable living and reimagining them with alternative uses exploits an existing situation that we found had enormous potential. At five years, we might see the development of more organized community efforts to grow and market produce, including farmers markets, Larger block associations might band together and consider farm tourism as a source of revenue. And by 10 years, a transformation from unused vacant lots to a system of support for the community could be well underway. We felt the impacts of Pharmadelphia could be far-reaching. Starting with small gestures rooted in the neighborhood block, the proposal contributes to an overall improvement in the quality of life and generates a new vision for organic urban living. The conversion of streets into farmland promotes pedestrian movement and discourages an auto-reliant world. Local community gardens have a new focus as they unite under a specificity of purpose. Pharmadelphia, we felt, had the power to transform Philadelphia's neighborhoods into new centers of activity through the magical alliance of city living and rural culture. 
Because this was a speculative project, we didn't have the luxury of in-depth dialogue with local stakeholders or conversations to understand the neighborhood need. But I think it's often as architects that we are asked to design for environments we may not have an intimate knowledge of. But I think we can set up frameworks for interaction and hope that this work creates spaces where communities have room to flourish. The Invisible Gate is a realized art installation in Gdańsk, Poland, which had similar parameters in that we did not have a deep familiarity with the site, nor necessarily with Polish culture. But having outsiders to your space can bring its own advantages in that we sometimes see solutions that don't occur to somebody rooted in the site. So the Invisible Gate is part of the outdoor gallery of the city of Gdańsk. The Lotznia Contemporary Art Gallery in Gdańsk sponsored a series of competitions to populate the outdoor gallery. And they asked for installations that would support a long-term revitalization plan which would transform the social and architectonic spaces of the neglected lower town. So the old town center is in the upper right-hand corner, and you can see it's marked by a, a circle, which is a tower, and there's a bridge that crosses and then a pathway, and the lower town is in this lower left-hand quadrant. The, the old town is sort of the center of town, the historical aspect of it, and then the lower town is more post-industrial and, and in a way a little bit cut off from the main part of town. The site is this pathway, and it connects the old town and the lower town, and the projects needed to integrate with the area, it needed to stimulate local community and visitors, reflect on the historical and present day conditions of the city and district, and potentially provide opportunities for workshops. What made the site particularly challenged was a highway running across the path leading towards the lower town. So you can see the highway is this, that cuts through the whole image. <laughs> Our proposal drew on the historical nature of Gdańsk, which, like many old fortress towns, is surrounded by a series of gates, each portal signifying the celebration of threshold. And Gdańsk, in particular, had, is surrounded completely by a series of gates. So in every direction that you enter or leave the old town is a gate. This one, the Golden Gate, leads from the town square across the river towards Lower Town. The Invisible Gate, our proposal, proposed to dissolve the highway as a familiar barrier and redefine it as a modern gateway. It would celebrate the entrance into the lower town, acting as a herald and declaration, and the duality of this gateway promotes a new relationship between the old town center and the post-industrial area of the lower town. We reclaim the path underneath as a primary pedestrian artery by erasing the heavy presence of the highway to reveal a landscape visually connected back to the old town and using mirror polished metal to create an illusory effect, reflections of the surrounding city conceal the highway from view and obscure the boundaries created by the bridge. The winning project that year was actually from Lex Rickers and Danielle Milnick, who proposed the LKW Gallery in the form of a truck rammed into the underside of the highway. It symbolically reflected the situation of the lower town quarter separated from the old town and in addition to serving as a commentary on the class differences between the two neighborhoods, the proposal could act as a public space for the integration of local community. The city, instead of implementing the second place project, used the remaining funds that year to implement our project, which was in third place, to realize the invisible gate. Um, in part, I think, because of the dialogue generated by the two projects. From the competition organizers. Covering the part of the highway with steel lining in the form of mirrors gives a new value to the lower town and undoes the mistake of those who had designed the flyover and separated two quarters from each other. It brightens up physically and metaphorically the space under the flyover, making it feel larger. Its fragmentary character is also a monumental project in scale, influencing the perception of the entire city. The mirrors and reflections create multiplications of the people, architecture, and the river providing a wide field for interpretation. It is worth emphasizing the play of light at successive times of day and the change of colors as an aesthetic and sensual quality. Moreover, this work is surprising and its location will encourage tourists to overcome the non-existent barrier and to visit the low town, lower town. We had always envisioned lighting beneath the overpass in conjunction with the mirrored surfaces, but due to budgetary constraints, that portion of our proposal was never realized. 
Unfortunately, several years later, another group of architects realized the same need. Fred Hatt and Daniel Schlepfer proposed amber drops, an installation of yellow translucent pebbles made of epoxy resins with a built-in LED lighting system. What made their proposal particularly striking was that the glowing amber drops would vary in time and rhythm, and so much like the breathing of a person as people pass through the space. They extended the pebbles out past the highway, including room for bike racks, in effect enlarging the potential for engagement with the, the space initially staked out by the gallery and the invisible gate. So Amber Drops took the synergy between our two existing installations and generated a fuller experience of the pathway along the Novo Motlava. And the area beneath the bridge has not only been completely transformed from a highway barrier to a place of activation, but is also now an easily accessible cultural center and annex location situated between Old Town and Lower Town for the Lotsenia Gallery. Though completely unplanned, the ability for the three projects to generate conversation with one another has burgeoned into a highly active space for community interaction. Even at night, the space remains lively. And though none of our projects were even designed in direct collaboration with one another, each held an openness that welcomed interaction and in both physically within the projects themselves and spatially for the visitors using the installations. So for Latsnia, we were tasked in a way with making space for a community where it didn't formally exist. But in this next project in the industrial blue collar town of Sharpsburg, PA, the community was already vibrant. They just needed a bigger space. The Sharpsburg Community Library wanted an addition at the rear of their existing structure. The problem with their request was that the building was a one-story, 1,300 square foot former restaurant made out of concrete block. In short, rather ugly and so unappealing that we proposed an alternative to radically change the library's presence in the city and to reflect their strong commitment to the neighborhood. The library, serving a small but progressive population, has long played an important role for its residents, and we felt that having a building which reflected that presence would be appropriate. So in conjunction with extensive community input, we undertook a careful assessment of the site and function, and were able to persuade the design committee of several key moves. The most dramatic move was to clad the building in colorful corrugated metal. Using packed clad metal panels, we were able to remain within the bounds of the very limited budget, but more importantly, the colorful volumes would revitalize the street presence of the library. In a way, we barely touched the existing structure at all. The second critical design decision included placing the public functions along Main Street to reorient the building's face towards the main thoroughfare. And then strategically using open glass panels along this facade would demonstrate to people passing by the most important content of the library, its users. The overhead volume we stretched over the entrance to form a canopy and used a tall red slab of color to mark the entry itself. From the side, low windows reveal an intriguing glimpse of the book stacks behind and the existing building, now almost completely surrounded by new construction, remained in use for study carols and a laptop bar. At the rear, we located a dedicated children's area in a green-colored wing, sheltered by a low roof line, and expandable with a simple garage door, opening up the space to outdoor seating in the back garden. We carried the bright colors from exterior to interior, to anchor the experience of space from street to inner sanctum. In areas where the existing structure remained, the repetition of the exterior colors became a simple and pretty effective way of suggesting a dynamic building whole. And throughout the project, we used industrial elements like concrete flooring, exposed trusses, mechanical ductwork. And not only did we consider the impact on a tight budget, but the elements also reflected the region's industrial roots. One year and about $400,000 later, the library was transformed. On the one hand, it can give off a childlike appearance with as many colors, but it's also a metaphor for the experience of the library, which is a place where a community of people assembles for a range of activities, all of which may be different, but which reflect a dynamic whole. You can see from the Google Street View that the library stands out in the town becoming a sort of a landmark element along Main Street. 
And the setback along the street and the dynamic shifting volumes creates an experience where community assembles in whatever configuration they need. My former professor, Art Lubetz, always likes to say that architecture should be incomplete, meaning we create spaces. I don't know why that happens. We create spaces that are left with an openness that gives the people who live or work there the flexibility to adapt to the architecture to better align with their ever-changing needs. And I think this is part of the idea of community, thinking of space not as an absolute unyielding force, but environments that are incomplete until they are filled with people who interact with the space and one another. The next project, like the library, already had a robust group of users and similarly existed in an environment unsuited to the activities taking place. The renovation for McNally Jackson Books is the smallest project we have ever worked on, with a budget so minuscule we were paid in books. And at the time of the renovation, the location was her first store in Lower Manhattan, one of the very few independent bookstores in downtown Manhattan. The renovation of the cafe into a space for book lovers helped propel the new, now, flagship location into a beloved mainstay of the neighborhood. So when we were brought in, the cafe was bland and uninspiring, and it didn't really reflect the spirit of literature fostered by the booksellers and users, and nor did it address a need for flexible programming. We began by addressing the overall proportions of the space. We moved the display and sales counter back a couple feet, extended the counter to accommodate and hide the recycling bins, and we also reconfigured the service areas behind the counter to open up the cafe area. Once we had resolved the relationship of space and circulation, we began making visceral connections to the act of reading in each programmatic function. To combat an aging sheetrock ceiling, we looked to the one resource we had plenty of, books, we came up with a series of installations using the books and basic hardware store supplies to distract the eye from conditions that we couldn't afford to renovate. So we scattered the ceiling suspended book installations throughout the space to generate a sense of energy within the cafe that would better reflect the types of conversations happening over a good read. Along the curved wall, the owner and I selected and scanned several book passages and put them together to create a wallpaper that would bring an auditory illusion of the rustling, of, of the rustling pages of a book being read. And then to accommodate flexible seating scenarios, we designed folding single desks so that the space could func function on multiple levels. With the desks folded up, the store would be able to host small evening events in the cafe, whereas during the day, the desks were used by individuals looking for a quiet place to have a cup of tea and read. We took a box of books to a local mill worker in Brooklyn who helped fabricate the ceiling hung elements while we debated which books would give us the greatest diversity of subject matter, color, and covers. And so as not to affect the operating hours of the bookstore, we had to conceive of the entire project as an installation that would take place well after the store had closed for the day. So everything was made, designed, assembled off-site, and brought to the store ready to be installed overnight. At its core, the cafe complements the store by creating a lively place for book lovers to come and feel embraced by the act of reading. I like to think that this project physically manifested the spirit of a community. And I think it's evident in my architectural practice that communities can be supported in any myriad of ways, and that our work builds space for this emotional relevance and, the, and fostering exchange between its users. The real question for me, and the question that I am asked most frequently, is how then does my art practice relate to my architectural practice? And until I thought less about the material embodiment of ideas and more about the people affected, I didn't really have an answer. Initially, it didn't feel like community played much of a role in making art at all. Drawing often feels very personal to me because it's usually an expression of whatever is mulling around in my head. For example, this series, She Is, I was feeling the frustration of assumptions placed on me as a woman, some of which stems from the culture I grew up in of very binary gender roles, but also the burden of being a woman in a still male-dominated field of architecture. I felt like women could and should be switch blades and peonies, exacto knives and chrysanthemums. And so the She Is series draws from my fascination with the fragility of nature intertwined with a love for man-made tools. 
Taken as a body of work, the series is a bit of a reflection on the multifaceted nature of women and the surety that we are as complex and varied as the intricate nature of the drawings themselves. Each drawing in the series has its own title, and when combined, they become part of a poem. She braids blades blindly. She seeks shards of shale. She weaves mace and sinew. She could be Vecnam. Each collector who bought a piece from 20 by 200, the gallery who carried the series, also received a copy of the poem with the full complement of drawing titles. And the gallery recently shared <laughs> the gallery recently shared feedback with me that each collector who bought a piece felt connected to the other buyers because the collection was more than individual abstracted images. It was a story linked together by a concept of femininity that went beyond traditional gender roles. And this is when I began to think about communities fostered through art. This project actually began because my pens kept exploding. And I hate that. It drives me nuts because I hate all that wasted ink. And so I would catch the ink splatters on scraps of paper. And then I'd turn the scribbles into small experiments, exploring ideas I was too nervous to try on larger canvases. The pieces take advantage of mistakes in ink flow or accidental markings. And even though I work on paper and arguably ephemeral media, I still sometimes feel the weight of expectation. And the ink blots were both a way not to waste ink, but also to alleviate the pressure of making something worthy. And maybe because of the fracturing of face-to-face -face community in the beginning days of COVID, I started sending out my drawing experiments off as postcards. Maybe I was craving interaction and dialogue or just giving space to chance because I didn't know if they would arrive or not. I kept making and sending small drawings. Every time I started a postcard size drawing, I felt compelled for it to exist in relationship to others like it. Maybe it comes from often being the only woman or person of color at the table, but one-offs feel lonely to me. I continued working at a mailable scale in an interconnected series. Uh, playing with color, I made a group of drawings based on the characters in Marcel Proust's In Search of Lost Time for my Proust book club. I wanted to try experimenting with brush strokes and paint, so I made this series using varying pen strokes underlaid with paint for the residents of the Odyssey House, which is a New York City-based re rehabilitation recovery center. I cut open a discarded cardboard mailer I found in our recycle bin to make a set of cards for my artist residency cohort, whose meeting in person would be delayed for a year and a half because of COVID. <clears throat> By making work that I would knowingly not hold onto, the project also became an exploration about the passage of time, expressed in these fragmented moments of drawing. I assembled them in my headspace as a body of work, which I then physically disseminated into the world as separate parts. Without any guarantee that the works reached their intended destination, the act of mailing the drawings resulted in the stretching of time, as each piece relies on domestic and international postal systems to arrive or not arrive. And to this day, I know of at least a dozen that never reached their intended destination, making me wonder, who has unwittingly become part of a community of works holding a fragment of creation in their hands? My dad likes to tell me in Vietnamese that we don't say thank you because it ends the connection between us. If I do something for you, I create a little thread between us. You don't have to thank me because we both acknowledge a connection now exists between us, tying us together. One day you might do something for me, tying me back to you. Saying thank you cuts the line and ends the story between us. And so maybe what I'm trying to do with this project, as I cast hundreds of tiny threads out into the world, is to build multiple stories across continents and time, making us all part of one community. I'm gonna end with a project about stories and community that is also about trying to rectify what I consider to be a historical omission. The Orloff series is the most directly architectural of my drawing work and begins with Chana Orloff, a sculptor in Paris in the early 1900s. This is her work. Uh, as part of an artist residency project, we were tasked with creating a series of drawings inspired by one of three Paris-based artists. According to all accounts, Chana Orloff exhibited as widely as her peers, Chagall, Matisse, 
but I'd never heard of her. And despite the utter modernity and scope of her work, her, whole, her name holds none of the same recognition as that of her male contemporaries. I had also recently read Being Here is Everything, Marie Duracek's account of the German expressionist painter Paula Modersen Becker, whose work you see here, also born in the late 1800s and working in Paris. I was completely captivated by the idea of women artists working at a time that seemed to have produced an endless supply of male genius, but curiously very little in the way of female voices. At the same time, my book group was finishing a five-year cycle of Proust and reading Ulysses for contrast, and I found myself increasingly annoyed by the brilliance of dead white men, constantly referencing one another, reinforcing the strict cycle of male genius. And I wondered why the same names were circulated over and over, whether in literature or in art. And the more I read, the more I discovered that Though as prolific and as talented women artists like Modersen Becker have completely fallen out of the narrative that comprises today's version of 20th century artists. I discovered 20 female artists born between 1860 and 1900. These change making artists push boundaries with their innovative and forward seeking work and the modernity of their labor at the turn of the century astounded me. And so these drawings are based on the spaces that those artists inhabited or worked in during their lives. I thought of their studio spaces as sanctuaries during a period when women were expected to be homemakers. And that despite the challenge, these women made their own places of conversation and discovery, sometimes within existing artist enclaves, but sometimes in the dining room of their home. I see the emptiness of the spaces as an invitation to add your own narrative. And though I feel a bit of sadness when I think about what has been lost through the passage of time, I'm also hopeful for the possibility and belief that past narratives can be changed. This and the previous drawing are based on Orloff Studio in the 14th arrondissement, which is today a museum filled with her work. Um, so often I would do a lot of research looking for the spaces that these women artists, and it's not always their studios, sometimes it's their homes, and then I'm making a, draw, a series of drawings based on those spaces. This one, for example, is based on the house that the artist Sophie Tober Arp designed for herself and her husband, the Dada artist Sean Arp. It became a meeting place for artists, writers, and intellectuals, including people like Alexandre Cadar and Marcel Duchamp. Her story, at least, is being added into the current day narrative because she has a retrospective exhibition that has traveled from the Tate in London and is now currently at the MoMA in New York. Whenever I think about women or people of color operating in spaces where they are alone or the first, I think of the incredible pressures they must have lived through every day to be part of a community where they may have never fully felt seen. Even today, being a minority in a profession dominated by a majority carries, carries with it an inescapable weight. And there are so many more of us now than there were in the 20th century. So you can see why in architecture and art, I'm really focused on this idea of creating spaces for communities to flourish. Uh, so often I have felt singular in the spaces I inhabit. And I think it is why I have drawn this particular community of artists out of the past. Maybe they were few in number in the early 1900s, but I hope this ongoing project extends their many contributions beyond place, space, and time itself. It's my way of saying aloha. Thank you. some of the themes that, um, that, that you spoke about and, and also maybe just to reflect on how I was receiving your, your lecture and how the way in which you unfold first the architectural projects and then the, the kind of art practice actually allowed me to better understand you as an architect and mm -hmm. as a designer and what it might mean uh, to be a, a, a woman architect and, and so that was uh, really uh, fascinating to see that unfold. The word that uh, came to mind t 
to me as, as I was watching the, uh, the architectural pieces was this idea of, of nimbleness. Mm. Uh, there, uh, you, you showed a really broad uh, representation of projects from something at an urban scale all the way down to the bookstore and the bridge and, and also uh, the, the invisible uh, bridge to me re-exemplified this idea of being nimble in the way that you were able to, to welcome these, these other pieces. Uh, and then what really struck me as you were talking about the postcards was this idea of, of the collective, right? How uh, they're, what really made the, the kind of art projects really striking to me was how they, they disseminate and kind of live as, as a collective and involve all of these different kinds of people. And so that really kind of brought me back to, to mm -hmm. the way in which you were really understanding uh, practice and how after understanding uh, your your postcards and the art practice I was better able to understand uh, the how the architectural pieces were really invested in uh, in addressing particularly the, the communities and the people that, mm. that they were serving so thank you so much thank you um, so do we have any questions from our audience or comments or reflections are also welcome I wanted to thank you for that reflection, actually, because I, I, I am asked a lot what the relationship is. And it wasn't actually until I heard Igor speak, and then Aunt, really Anne following up on that, that made me think about that, because I'm always looking for the visual relationship. What's the, how does my visual architecture relate to my visual art? And it doesn't. And, and it wasn't really until I thought about the people who are involved in the interaction that's happening that I realized, oh, there's something else that's underneath all of that. Like, if I stop looking and I just start listening to what it is, then I can find that connection. And I think that's, that's helpful to hear that it is, that maybe it's making sense to you, too. <laughs> like, <laughs> city that has a lot of complexity, both in terms of identity categories that you're describing, in terms of ecology, in terms of urbanization, and how do you see this particular place in this moment in your career influencing your work moving forward? Uh, that's a good question, Igor, to think about how Houston might influence my work and really the presence of the city. It's unlike any city that I'm familiar with, or the city that I'm most familiar with. And actually, I was talking to Amna about this, and we were speaking about urban design and the idea that, that urban design in Houston is a lot different than urban design in some other cities. And so I'm thinking about all of these kind of disparate parts in a way, and like, how do they connect, and how can I find my way into them without a car? <laughs> I think that's also my, my, the interesting moment right now is that I'm still just walking, and so my radius is really small. And I'm wondering if, if I need to know Houston, then I have to expand beyond that, and, and do I have any other choice but to get in an Uber or to rent a car? And so I'm curious, like, the evolution of how that's going to work out. Like, right now, I really know University Boulevard super well. <laughs> and all of the restaurants in Rice Village, which I can walk to still. Have you discovered a side of the Vietnamese Houston that surprised you, that was different than what you experienced before? Uh, I'm not used to having Vietnamese people around in my communities. Like in New York, we're, we're scattered a little bit more. There's no one. I, I don't live in the Bronx and in Queens and the, the neighborhoods where they exist frequently. And here I encounter them all the time. Like I lost my wallet in the airport and the security guard, the TSA guy who came to take my information was, to, and I'm flustered because I lost my wallet and I'm trying to go home. And he started speaking to me in Vietnamese and I didn't even think about it. And I started responding because he was speaking to me. And then two heartbeats later, I realized, oh, this is a, a Vietnamese guy and he's asking me these questions. And the same thing happened in an Uber. So I, it's like this funny, like drawing out of something that I'm not used to having drawn out, which is happening a lot in Houston.
Yeah, I mean, I, that's, it's, that's sort of the question that I try and answer the most, which is how, does this, how do these two practices sort of directly relate to one another or influence one another outside of the, the conceptual kind of framework? Um, and I think, and this is what I've told the studio also, is that I think that drawing is really about an act of seeing and understanding a space. So when I'm drawing, I'm trying to understand something about what I'm making. And I think architecture is also the same, right? That you're, you may not be translating what you see into a drawing, but you're also trying to understand what it is that you're experiencing. And I think drawing is just a method of, of trying to understand that better or to practice at getting used to learning how to understand spaces. Thank you. Uh, I, a, I was fascinated by the, the Farmadelphia project. Um, I, I know the city a little bit, not as much as Houston, but certainly I'd be intrigued by those areas that have been left abandoned. And I thought your project was insightful in many levels. And one thing it reminded me also of Ben Franklin's almanac and his whole idea of cultivation and yeah. along the city and all that. But the thing that I was most Way the buildings participate, but they're not the main protagonists. You know, in other words, the buildings are found as abandoned, or, and in some of the images you show them as they participate somehow, it became a, a, a milking station or whatever. But uh, were they? Did you think more about that? Because I couldn't read the drawings were so small. But when, when the buildings become more say, integrated in the landscape as well, or the I mean, yeah, for Farmadelphia, we definitely thought of both the, the conversion into farmland and the buildings as, as one thought process and that the buildings would be sort of integral to that process. I think, you know, one of the things that you have the luxury of in speculative projects is you don't have to worry, for instance, about the smell of a stable. <laughs> You know, so there are a lot of aspects of, of rehabilitating abandoned buildings that you can propose, but that actually might not work. But the idea of thinking about those buildings not as habitable structures anymore, but, but some other use, right, that doesn't require, for instance, 100% conditioning, I think is valuable. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea that to return the buildings to their actual erosion and integrate that for that was I mean, in a way, it's like what Anne was talking about with the garage projects, where all these garages exist and these secret things are happening in the, you know, behind them. And so maybe we should think about those things happening in the light as opposed to you know, behind closed doors and, and see what happens. Thank you. On the <laughs> uh, can I elaborate on the fragility in my drawings and in the theoretical work? I mean, I, I think you could say that that has a little bit to do with the sense of incompleteness also, where there's things that are just left up to chance that you can't, you can't contain or predict or design for. And so I think, to me, when I think about fragility, I think about this like precariousness, right? That exists also when people interact with each other because you don't know what's going to happen. Um, so maybe that's a, a way of answering that question. I'm not 
not sure. I'm not sure I can answer that question. <laughs> The relationship you mean between the communities that we're coming into and the work that we're doing as outsiders? Yeah, and the theoretical mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, definitely, definitely. I think in the case of Farmadelphia especially, that really felt like a, a, an, an outsider coming in and saying, okay, I see this problem, I'm gonna fix it by doing this. And I think as a theoretical project to explore what could possibly happen, I think great. But if we were to actually implement something like that, I think there's so many more layers that would need to happen before you get, even get close to that point. And maybe you would never get close to that point because you would go in and the community would be like, I don't really want to own a stable. Are you crazy? You know, so I think there's a, a, a place for thinking about those ideas and what could be. Um, but then also the reality of like the invisible gate, I think, is a good one where we came in and we, we had this idea and they were like, okay, actually maybe that will be good and maybe that will do something for the neighborhood, but it easily could have not. Well, Igor, that is my other problem with Houston right now, is because I'm limited to my feet. I'm very also limited to my food options. <laughs> and so I think I will be eventually forced to uh, Uber somewhere. But um, yes, food has played a long, uh, important role in my work, just as a human being, I think, but also in all of the ways that I think about uh, community. So, Food is one of the aspects of community that I find the most compelling in a way because it's so easily shared and it's so easy to have conversations about food. Even when it's bad food, you can still talk about how bad it is. But it, I think the, the dialogue and the, the spirit of eating together to me is really important. So it is one thing I'm, like, I need to find in Houston is, my, is how to navigate that part. Thank you, Louise. <laughs> Hi. Um, I have a question that relates to your work um, in organizations um, beyond your architecture or artistic practice. I know you're involved in New York in, in playgrounds and NYC, I think at a board level. And I was wondering if you could talk about how you participated in the interactive community at a, at a governance level as an architect, uh, because I presume that you're not implementing your own projects and you're very taking the community looking at others. And I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about that. This is actually a really good question, which maybe relates to what Amna was asking also. I, so I sit on the board of uh, Playground NYC, which is a nonprofit in New York, and the, the organization is about transforming spaces for play for children. And we have a flagship location on Governor's Island, which is, it's called an adventure playground, which, which is a space supported by play workers where kids can come and have the freedom to do whatever they want, I mean, essentially whatever they want. Uh, and so this is a really interesting question because we're looking to expand the services out into the broader community. Right now we only have, we're doing a couple of pop-ups and we're getting involved in schools. And the question on the board is really how do we, how do we identify communities where that need is coming from the community and not us coming in and saying, we think you need a playground here. And so that's been a really big topic of conversation about you know, and also trying to find the, the areas where we might make a bigger impact. So less in Brooklyn where we have some pop-ups, maybe out further out in the Bronx or in Queens, right, where, they, where it's demonstrated that there's a lack of play, where there's demonstrated lack of uh, playgrounds and access for, for kids. Um, but it's hard because some of those communities don't have the time almost to be able to interact with us and for us to be able to say, hey, wait, we have the funding, we have the people, but you know, it still requires a lot of work. And so that's been a big challenge on the board actually, and a very good question.
much for joining me. And thank, thank you. Thank you. Again for a thank you. Uh, presentation. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>